Well, I'd like to begin with a look at one of the ornate illuminations that decorate many of the best poems of the Middle English period. We've now come to the sixth lecture in our survey across the traditions of English poetry, Middle English poetry. And the Middle English period is roughly dated from 1066 um, with the Norman invasion in 1066 with William the Conqueror all the way up to 1470, 1480. Um, so just right before the Renaissance, so that's going to be our next lecture. But I want to show you a picture. This is a full page, beautifully illuminated picture depicting Geoffrey Chaucer, the great Middle English poet uh, who was born somewhere around 1340, maybe 1343, some scholars guess, and who died in 1400, right at the turn of the 15th century. And here he is, you can see him there in the middle, reading his poem, Troilus and Crusade, to the court, Richard II. And there they are down there. Um, it's interesting. Some of them, you see this figure here on the right with the, with the hand on the chin, listening to the tragedy of Troilus and, and Crusade. You have Ladies, it's it's mixed company. You have this fellow on the far left looking over. He's in the blue with the wide collar, looking over at the lady he's sitting beside, perhaps discussing or whispering about the events in Troilus and Crusades. You have these two women in front. Uh, they look like they're talking, the two sitting side by side, and the two in the blue dresses, too. You see the one holding up her arm uh, as though perhaps in comfort. Uh, laying her hand on the shoulder of, of the woman beside her. And there we have Chaucer here. And then above, I believe, is the depiction of the tragic moment in the play, or rather in the poem, where a crusade is exchanged outside the walls of Troy. Before I begin, this copy, by the way, of Cha is, is from Chaucer's Troilus and Crusade. It was made sometime shortly after the death of Chaucer. So it could have been someone who knew Chaucer, and was depicting his likeness here, copied sometime between 1415 and 1425, long after the poem was originally written. The poem Troilus and Crusade was written in 1385. But let me read you the first stanza of Troilus and Crusade. The doble sol of Troilus to tell him that was the king Priamo son of Troy in loving how his adventures fell from woe to wail and after out of joy me purposes, that after ye part from ye. They Sephane, thou help me for tendit this woeful verse, that weepen as ye read, or rather, that weepen as ye read. The double sorrow of Troilus to tell. That was the king Priam, son of Troy. In loving how his adventures fell from woe to well. And after, out of joy, my purpose is before I part from you. Uh, Thesephony, thou help me to tendit, or record, or write this woeful verse that weep as I now write. Weeping as he's writing. Something interesting about this, this scene we have on the left is the aspect of entertainment, one, and also the oral performance of poetry that was still retained. It is the sound of the poem. Um, as T.S. Eliot says, the, the first criterion for, for a poem should be not that it's understandable and intelligible, but rather, is it readable? Does it sound? And this is certainly a part a key part of Middle English poetry. Well, welcome all to our sixth lecture on English poetry, beginning with the backgrounds. Uh, we finished with the four lectures of background poetry, and now we're moving up uh, towards the contemporary poets along our 13-week journey. I'm joined online by uh, my students on Patreon, who will be joining me after the lecture for Q&A and discussion, along with some further readings. Uh, so if you'd like to support my public humanities work on YouTube and to even join the live discussions over Zoom and conversation on Discord, please check out the link below 
in the description. In our last lecture, we dealt with the Anglo-Saxon period from around 500 to 1066. We explored some major characteristics of the Old English verse, including its meter, its organization, its major themes, and some of the religious and cultural contexts. Uh, my goal with that lecture and with this and with all these lectures within this series is to equip you with tools to read and enjoy these poems on your own. How do you go back uh, to the books yourselves and, and, and read and enjoy uh, and learn how to appreciate and even know what to look for when you're reading it and about some of the contexts? So now we come to the Middle English poetry, which spans roughly from the Norman invasion where we left off up to the ascension of King Henry VII, which actually was in 1485. So that makes it a slightly longer period uh, if you mark it off with King Henry VII. But to go back to the Norman invasion, this was a very important moment for English history, for English language, and for English literature. William the Conqueror, William the Conqueror conquered England, and when he did, he found a land that was basically divided into feudal kingdoms ruled by aristocracy. It was the English church that provided it was the glue to the society. They provided some cohesion to the culture of England. But for the most part, the island was ruled by local systems of governance. Uh, the language of the government after the invasion was Norman French. English would not be permitted in English legal documents until the mid-14th century. This meant that after 1066, England was trilingual. The natives, if you were to go into the towns, into the markets, they would be speaking Old English. You go into the churches, the monasteries, they would be reading and, and writing and speaking in Latin. Many of the monks would have spoken Old English too, especially if they were native-born in England, and possibly some, some Old French. But the king and his court, which is where much of the literature was produced, was Norman French. This meant that the English language generally gradually blended with Norman French. It was gradually simplified in structure, the English language. Its vocabulary expanded. You had Latinate words coming in. You also had old French words coming in. And the literary trends that survive, we have records of, lean towards French refinement. Um, we're going to begin, we're going to read mostly uh, the late period of the Middle English poets. We have Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. We're going to look at him. We're going to look at Piers Plowman uh, by the poet William Langland. And then we're going to, of course, look at Chaucer. That's about all we'll look at uh, in this lecture. It's really a crash course. But it started with troubadour poets in the 11th century. These were poets, mostly French, traveled through Europe, and their French musical poetry and expression became significant upon English literature, English poetry especially. And this, I think, is where the influence begins. English, English would eventually come out on top. When English does reemerge in the 15th century, it was deeply changed lexically and even syntactically at that point. So, and I think, I think, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is such an excellent example of, of this, and we're going to look at that. But before we turn to Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, I want to talk a little bit about how English changed in its lexicon. Uh, English is one of the most etymologically diverse languages in the world, um, and it's through this vocabulary additions through the trilingual age at this time. Um, when William the Conqueror came in, he replaced English governance, governance uh, with Anglo-Norman, or rather Norman aristocracy. So the Anglo-Saxon rulers were kicked out, the Normans came in. He did the same thing with the church. He replaced Anglo-Saxon bishops with his own episcopate. And this greatly changed even the religious culture because the Anglo-Saxon religious culture was different from the French continental, as you can imagine. In terms of literature, the stories of the ancient king author, the English king, which began in Wales, 
became a huge literary interest on the continent shortly after. You were so fascinated by these native English stories. In French, you had the great Chrétien de Troyes, who wrote stories of uh, Sir Eric, Sir Wayne, and many others, Knights of the Round Table, Adventures. You have the chivalric romances. You had uh, Marie de France, whose uh, Breton lays were verse stories and poems about the knights of King Arthur's court. This also made it to Germany. The great medieval old German poet Hartmann von Aue uh, writes uh, beautiful stories about the knights of King Arthur, all coming from this Welsh native uh, tradition. In England, uh, Thomas Mallory and many others participate in this tradition. You even have the alliterative Mortatur, which uh, was written by an anonymous Middle English poet. But Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, as the name suggests, participates in this Arthurian tradition, this Arthurian legend canon. Um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight was written about the time Chaucer died. It was around the time of the turn of the 15th century, so around 1400. It shows the rising presence of this of French words in both writing and speech. Some of the words you, are, are changed. You begin to see how, the transformations that English underwent uh, during this during this period. So take this passage of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. There we go. Here it is. This is when Gawain is about to set out on his adventure. This is Sir Gawain and Green Knight is one of the richest stories in Middle English. It's a profound reflection upon chivalry and what it means to uphold the integrity of character, of honor. Um, some of the scenes in this poem are just enchanting, strange, even they're mysterious, almost occult-like. One gets the feeling that when you're reading it, there's this deep spiritual significance that is lost to us as modern readers. Uh, it is suffused with this deep sense of magic and of an understanding that nature is alive with divine energies, what the Irish Christian scholar Erigena called the Logoi, these divine wills of nature. But here's a passage just before Gawain sets out. It's important. He's getting dressed. And this is so fascinating. I'll pronounce it as Chaucer Wood. Um, that's, it, it might have sounded a little bit different because this author of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, scholars know that he came from the Northwest Midlands and was writing sometime around the late 14th century. That puts him in the same time period as Chaucer, but Chaucer was a, was a Southerner um, around London. And it, it it changed. So this has, I think, um, more similarities with Old English. He dwelleth there all that day, and dresses on the morn, asketh early his armis, and alle were they brought. First, a two le tapet teacht over the flat, and Nietzsche was that guild, gare that glint there aloft. The stiff man steppeth thereon, and the steel hondolers, dobed in a doublet of a dare tars. And seeth in a crafty capados, close it aloft, that with a bricht blauna was bonding within. He dwells there all that day, and dresses on the morning, asks early for his arms, his armor. And all of them were brought. First, a, a tulle tappet, a tappet. It's related to tapestry. Uh, it's like a carpet. It's some, it's some woven fabric. Tula, and I'm indebted to the scholar Andrew Sanders for this help here. Tula was crimson. So we have a crimson carpet or tapestry laid out tight over the floor, and much did that armor shine, glint there aloft, thereupon. 
The strong man steps thereon. He's going to get dressed. He's stepping on the carpet. And the steel handles. He handles the steel. He takes it up. Dobbed in a doublet of a dire tars. Dubbed, dressed in a doublet, which was the cloth underneath an armor. And of a deer are costly tars. Now tars um, is a reference to a fabric that comes from Tharsia, which is said to have been on the west border or on the east border of China. Um, so perhaps Turkestan, uh, but this was a costly fabric, probably silk, made in Tharsia. It's a deer tars, a costly. And Suthin and since are thereafter. Now you remember this word actually came up last lecture in the old English lecture um, when I was reading. Grendel coming in, breaking in through the doors, pronounced it Suthin. The I, the, the Y here is Suthin in Middle English. A crafty capados, a well made or crafty cap, capados, a hat, a hood, really, that went over the head and closed a lock. That with a brich blauen, with a bright ermine. Um, was bound within. So within the the hood where, was this warm ermine fur. Now you notice that there are some French influence here. There's even a global influence, which the Norman invasion, the connection with the continent that came to England at this time definitely connected it with the rest of the world. And we see that here. Um, the steel. He's talking about the dress though. And I in the old English poem, Beowulf, you hear a lot about weapons. The poet really likes to describe the weapons. But perhaps this is a, this reflects a Norman interest in, in fashion. There's, there's great importance to what he's wearing before he goes out on his journey. So Latin provided the means for elevated language. Uh, we see a little bit of that here. Um, but again, we also see, let me just erase some of this. You also notice that all of a sudden, it's almost as though it's an old English poem with the alliteration. Dobbed in a doublet of a dere tars, crafty capados closed a lock, bricht blauna was bonded within. It's always operating just like Old English poetry. And we see this happen in the, in the, in the uh, uh, in Middle English period, sometime in the middle of the 14th century. So in the 1350s or so, there was a sudden outpouring among poets of alliteration. It was like this revival of the alliterative style. It came back. Uh, almost in the same fashion of Old English poets, and it lasted long into the 15th century. We don't see Chaucer playing with alliteration much. One of his characters makes fun of it, actually. Uh, but we see him doing it sometimes, especially in the, the Canterbury Tales, when um, different characters speak. One of the great alliterative poems to come out of this period is The Vision of Piers Plowman. It was written sometime around 1370 through 1386, possibly around 1377, some scholars place it. Don't know anything really about the author other than he was probably from the Malvern Hills in the West Midlands region. They think he was an educated clerk, a married man, not a priest, but uh, working in the church office. And the text frames him as a hermit who goes on this dream venture quest to find religious truth. In a way, it anticipates the Protestant movement and some of the proto-Protestant uh, movements that were going around a lot going on going on around this time, like uh, with Lollards. Uh, but this is not a Lollard text. 
but it is it is related to it. It does its its sensibilities are aligned with that. It, throughout the poem, the question moves from a search from truth to a search of what it means to live well. What does it mean to do good? It's not unlike the dream of the rude, which we read last week with the old English poem, the first that we have, or the earliest dream poem recorded in English, the cross that spoke to the dreamer. But this is a poem about English religiosity and English piety. It's not a single dream vision, but rather it's a, it's a string of visions threaded upon a single voice that holds together the narrative. Um, it's, it's highly readable in translation. If you're looking for a text, go for the B text, what's often called the B text. There are three main texts, three versions as he was working through them. Uh, recently, there was a fourth, sometimes called the Z version, and they say that it's earlier than the A version. The A version was written first, then the B text, then the C, but the B text is the only complete revised form, and it contains the best poetry. So usually, if you find a copy of Piers Plowman, it's going to be from the B text, but you'll want to look for that. Let me read you a little bit of it. This one was included on the Harvard list too, by the way. I think I mentioned the same comments about Lollardism. In a summer season, when soft was the sun, he shook me into shrouds as he a chef were, in habit as a hermit unholy of workers, went weed into this went weed in this world wondrous to hear. Ach, on a May morning, on Malvern Hills, me befell a furly, a fairy me thought. It was worry for wandered, and when they made to rest under a broad bank and a born a seed. And as he lay and leaned there, and looked on the waters, he slumbered into a sleeping, and swathing so much. Dan gan he met in a marvellous swerving that he was in a wilderness wist he never where. In a summer season, when soft was the sun, I dressed me in shrouds, clothes, or habit, as if I were a sheep. Already strange. In habit or dress, as a hermit unholy of works, went wide into this world to hear of wonders. But, ach, on a May morning, morning, on Malvern Hills, on a May morning, on Malvern Hills, it happened to me. Yeah, this is where it gets interesting. Of fairy, me thought. Fairy was another way of saying something supernatural occurred. I was weary, uh, wondered, wearied from wondering, perhaps, for wondered, for wondered, and went me to rest under a broad bank by a stream side, a boredom. See, uh, Burn in, in uh, Robert Burns' poem. Um, we, we long have paddled about the burn. I think that it's a reference to the stream. And as I lay and leaned and looked on the waters, I slumbered into a sleep. It swayed so merrily, basically talking about the water swaying so merrily that he fell into a sleep. Then I began to meet a marvelous dream. Or then I had a marvelous dream, rather, that I was in a wilderness and I did not know where I was. You'll notice the alliterations. And it's, it's almost two. You've got the sejura, some, some of the lines, where you have two stressed syllables on one half, two on the other. But don't go looking for that, because that'll lead you astray. But it sometimes happens, like in this line. In a solemn session, when soft was the song. Notice the stressed syllables receiving the alliteration. Um, Befell a furle, a ferie, me thought. Um... Weary for wandering and went to me to rest. 
I'm not quite sure actually which one of these E's are pronounced. And uh, this is a difficult point for scholars. Not everyone, uh, sometimes the E's, you don't know which ones to sound, um, especially in prose. In Chaucer, you can figure it out by counting the, by scanning the line. I'll talk a little bit about that. Let's move on to Chaucer. It was Sir Philip Sidney, whom we'll encounter in our next lecture on the Renaissance poetry, who wrote that Chaucer undoubtedly did excellency in his Troilus and Cressida, of whom truly I know not whether to marvel more, he says, either that he in that misty time could see so clearly, or that we in this clear age walk so stumblingly after him. And Sidney says he had some defects, but uh, they are to be forgiven because he is such a great poet. Troilus and Crusade is a great poem. It's his great poem. The Canterbury Tales get the spotlight. Uh, they're the most fun. But, but during his time, a serious poet had to deal in tragedy. And Troilus and Crusade is that tragedy. Now, I studied these works under two different Middle English professors, R.A. Schoff and James Simpson, and they both, both pronounced Crusade differently, the title, Troilus and Crusade. One pronounced it Cressidy and the other Crusade. Um, so I, I think whenever it fits in the line, it kind of depends on whether that final E is sounded. It's a beautiful poem. I mean, it's heartbreaking. Um, a poem of of love and love lost. It's also a poem that reflects the, the courtly love tradition, what is called the amour courtois or the fin amour tradition, as they call it in, in Italy. And Cha Chaucer did go to Italy and may have met Petrarch, who really um, capitalized, I guess that's not quite the right word, but uh, incorporated much of the Finamor tradition into his, his sonnets. It's the idealization of love, the idealization of a beloved, of a, of, of a woman, usually. And it kind of went on with Marian theology, um, blended there with, with some Marian piety. But it was, it was love of this otherworldly goddess. You fell in love with someone, and it was usually with someone far above your station, this woman who was beautiful, who would never look at you, you're, you're so beneath her, and she's just this goddess. And the same thing happens to Troilus in this tragic moment, where Troilus, this is fascinating, this is psychologically interesting, because Troilus, I'm going to read this passage, comes away from the temple. He sees Crisane in the temple with her maidens and her train, and it makes such an impression, he goes back to his room, and in memory, sees her and it's in this recre recreation of the, the the beauty of her in his mind where the real moment of his falling in love happens he do upon oh let's start here at the top and one that he in chamber was alone he do upon his bed as fat him set and first began to see and f to groan and thought her eye on her soul Without and let, thinking about her, obsessing. But as he sat and woke, his spirit met that he here saw a temple, and all the wees reached of her lock and gan it knew a viz. And this is the moment where he encounters her memory, the recreation, the idealization. Thus gan he mark a mirror of his mind in which he saw all holy her figure, and that he well caught in his heart a find, it was to him a richt good adventure to love so chorn, and if he did, did his cure in serving her, yet michte he fall in grass, or else for own of her solvents pass. He's so taken with her beauty, the impression of it significantly, the memory of it, that it's there where he begins to fall in love. Um, 
Chaucer, uh, he, in, he introduced iambic pentameter into English. Roughly, and one but hey, and chambre was so long. So you don't sound any of these E's because it fits without it. And wambate and chambre, chambre, you do, you do actually sound this E. Chambre was alone. Iambic pentameter, he's the first one to do that. Um, and this is, by the way, called Rhyme Royale. John Dryden. Going back to the iambic pentameter here, John Dryden um, acknowledges that Chaucer is, well, he calls him the father of English poetry, for one. He says that he must have been a man of a most wonderful, comprehensive nature because he has taken into the compass of his, of his poems, the Canterbury Tales, the various manners and humors of the whole English nation in his age. The father of English poetry uh, had to wrestle with syllabic ways. That was one of the things that he had to struggle with because French. And remember, that if you really wanted to be a good poet, you wrote in French uh, during the court, his time in court, and, and, and he was. Um, but Donald R. Howard, who has a biography of Chaucer, has an examination of his metrics. And you remember in our lecture on Old English that English meter is stress counted. It's what's called qualitative meter, meter organized by stressed syllables coming at intervals. Um, the, it's different from the Latin languages in which it's counted with syllabic weight. The quantitative, so if you take the title of a very popular poem at this time, Romance, or the Roman de la Rose, well, it sounds like da 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 da. It doesn't actually go up, it's just lengthened. Roman de la Rose. But if you translate that into English, the romance of the rose, or the romance of the rose, what you have is stress, not elongated vowels. That's something he had to negotiate. There's a great resource, and there's a link to this in the description below. There's a great resource to pronouncing Old English. Uh, and some scholars uh, disagree. You know, there are some ambiguities about what it really sounded like. But here it is on the Harvard uh, Chaucer website. Um, this is all free to access, by the way. So you could practice with this. You come to an, a Y or an I, usually pronounced a long E sound, meat. Find an E or a double E. It's A, may, mate, mate. You see an E? Um, baga, rada, pronounced like bag, the A in bag. You come to an A, it's usually an A, ah, very open mouth vowel. Mata, mat. Come to a U or an OU, it's U, as in hoos. Um, o and in bo, and, and with a double O, it's like oak. A bot, bota, and the O is A, ah, loth, ok. It's like that. So you can hear the sounds. This is a great website, by the way, to, to tinker with. So having heard that, with the last thing I want to do in this lecture is to look at the beginning of the Canterbury Tales, which is just beautifully musical. Iambic pentameter. Um, let's see. Let's go down here. Um, and these are the first lines, the first 18 lines of the Canterbury Tales, the general prologue at the beginning. And he's setting the scene with this periodic style. One that April with a shorter sort, the draught of March hath passed to the rota, and bathed every vein in switch liquor, of which virtue engendered is the floor. When Zephyrus ache with his sweater breath, in spirit hath in every hort and heath the tender croppies and the youngest son. Hath in the dram his half a corsi run, and smaller fowlers make an melodia that slip in all the nicht with open ear. So pricketh them nature in her courages than long in folk to go on pilgrimages, and palmers for to sake in stronges strondes to fern a hallways 
Coof and Sondry Londis, and specially from every Shearer's end of Engeland to Canterbury they wind, the holy blissful martyr for to seca, that him hath hope and one that they were seca. Now, if you go back to the Harvard website, you can read all of the Middle English, or rather the Canterbury Tales in translation, with the Middle English there right above it. So when April, with its sweet-smelling showers, has pierced the draught of March to the root, and bathed every vein in such liquid by which power the flower is engendered, are created. Now, it'd be helpful if they just used the, the nearest translation. Um, when the west wind, Zephyrus, also with his sweet breath, in every wood and field has breathed life into the tender new leaves and the young sun has run half its course in Aries, and small fowls make melody, those that sleep all the night with open eyes, so nature incites them in their hearts, then folk long to go on pilgrimages, and professional pilgrims, palmers, to seek strange shores, to distant shrines, known in various lands, and specially from every shire's end of England to Canterbury, they travel, or wind, 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 to seek the holy blessed martyr who helped them when they were sick. Chaucer, just a brief word on the Canterbury Tales, and I, I'd like to do a whole course on the Canterbury Tales. I'm going to flesh all these lectures out with other lectures uh, in the future, and it'd be great to just go through all of the all of the Canterbury Tales. But Chaucer introduces his pilgrimage, or his pilgrims, by saying that the people want to travel in spring, in April, on pilgrimages to the shrine. It's not explained here, but it's understood the, the shrine of St. Thomas Becket to whom they prayed to when they were sick. And so they, they paid vows, help me when I'm sick, I'll, I'll pay a, a pilgrimage. And so they recover and they go as soon as spring begins. By the way, T.S. Eliot in The Wasteland, when he says that April is the cruelest month, he has Chaucer's general prologue in mind. So I think that the memory of the plague is here. In the 14th century, there was a terrible plague but for the most part in the Canterbury Tales, there is an interesting absence of political events of the day. The poem is more about English life and people and stories and the imaginative texture of medieval life in England. Richard II's reign was pretty tumultuous. Plague, you had schism, you had the peasants revolt that ended in, in regicide. Doesn't, doesn't appear at all in the Canterbury Tales. And what, what follows in the general prologue is a description of the characters, which is just something to delight and relish in. Chaucer, for such a long book, the solution to what would be monotony of one singular voice telling stories and stories and stories is to have multiple pilgrims tell different stories as they travel along. And that's the premise of the book. They're all different stories, some very pious some magical, some folkloric, some body. Fablo uh, tradition is it's very raunchy. There's a lot of bathroom humor, sex humor. Uh, it's all there. The, the most elevated style of, of religious lighting, writing is there too. Something to keep an eye on. And if you want to finish the general prologue and read the descriptions of the pilgrims, you're in for a treat. Every, it's a great survey of medieval, it's like going back in time, really, because you, you have a sense of every rung in social history of church and states. You have a land-owning Franklin, you've got the knight and his son, they're the gentle folk, high blood, place of honor. Um, you have the merchant, an important class in England, is becoming more and more important during this time. You have a provincial woman and a cloth maker who is an expert on England's leading industries. She's the wife of Bath. 
You've got the master mariner, the shipman. You've got the miller. He's a little low class. Hilarious, by the way. Upper servant class with the reed. Lower classes with yeomans and cooks. Um, then you have the church. You've got monks, prioress, prioresses, um, attendant priests. You've got a parson and a roaming friar. You've got summoners and pardoners. They're all there. Everyone who made up the fabric of medieval life in England makes an appearance here in the general prologue. Uh, and it's just fascinating to read, not just from a sociological perspective, but from a literary perspective. And all of their their descriptions and, and who they are as individuals, um, all described very tenderly in the general prologue, all of that you see into the inner life of their minds when they tell the stories. So there's a poetic quality in the prologue that's, that's linked to the tales themselves. So in conclusion, I think if you were to buy a Chaucer, you could buy Neville Coghill's translation. I have that. I have William Morris's translation. Uh, Jill Mann also has a good translation that's in Penguin Classics. I don't think it is the complete Chaucer. You're going to have to check if you want the whole book to make sure you're not getting an abridged version because sometimes they'll omit some of the less funny or not so great stories. But the most important ones will be there. Also check out the Harvard website and for that guide on uh, translations and, and um, pronunciation. And in the next meeting, we'll be dealing with the Renaissance poets. So thanks everyone for joining. I'm now going to stop the recording and move into the discussion. Thanks for watching and until next time.